So, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 23 says that even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with Jews, I lived uh, like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I lived under that law. Even though I'm not subject to the law, I did I, I did this so that I could bring Christ to those who are under the law. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and to share in its blessings. Now, Paul had a huge heart to share the gospel with those around him. After his amazing life-changing experience, he felt very much compelled to share the gospel with anyone and everyone, every chance he got. And these verses are talking just about where Paul's heart was. He's saying that he was constantly looking for ways to communicate his love for God with others. To those that were poor, he would he would assume the role of being poor and, and, and go and live amongst them. To the ones that were smart, he would enter into intellectual conversation and he would preach a message that would appeal to their higher sense of learning. You know, he's basically saying in these verses that he was going to do whatever it took in that particular situation to give glory to God and to allow others to be introduced to Christ. He was going to do whatever it took as long as it didn't mean that he had to give up his own Christian values and morals for other people to be able to see Christ and experience Christ and know about Christ's love for him. Now, one of the things he's not saying in this verse, he's not saying that we all have to be everything to others or that we all have to have the same gifts. He's not saying that all of us are going to have to be able to speak really well or be able to share the gospel really well or that we're all going to know the Bible inside and out. He's not saying that we're all going to be teachers or that we're all going to be great musicians. What he's saying is you need to use what you have and whatever means that you can to impact the world around you. He's saying that, that instead of us seeking our own glory, instead of us wanting to draw attention to ourselves, that we should be taking our talents and our gifts and, and yes, even our weaknesses to bring glory to God. Now, let me just tell you something here that's absolutely amazing to me and something that I think many of us don't think about, but God can use your weaknesses and your struggles to speak to other people. And oftentimes that's the thing we struggle with the most. We're, we're quick to boast about our strengths and the things that we're good at. And we're quick to use the things that we're good at in order to praise God and to share God with others. But then at the other time, sometimes we don't want to talk about our weaknesses because that shows that we're vulnerable. And yes, sometimes in those moments of, of being vulnerable, that's when we can have the greatest impact in somebody else's life. When they know that we are just as we're struggling just like they are. And God can use those struggles and how you've worked through those struggles in order to help somebody else through those struggles. Now, I'm going to throw up here on the screen some things that I think that everybody ought to take note of. And I think it's something worth really thinking about as we talk about using everything that God's given us. Because in these verses, Paul gives us some really important guidelines for ministry. That if we're going to go out into this world and we're going to be able to start impacting this world and changing the world around us, here's some things that we need to start focusing on. Number one, we need to find common ground with those that we come into contact with. Everybody that we talk to, you can find some amount of, of, of way to connect with them, some type of something you have in common with them. Number two, if you're really going to minister to other people around you, then you need to avoid a know-it-all attitude. Don't act like you've got all the answers because you don't. Number three, you need to make others feel accepted. If you're going to reach out to people and use your gifts to share Christ with them, you've got to make everybody feel a part of things. 
that means that you've got to reach out to the ones that you really don't want to reach out to. That means that the people that annoy you are sometimes the ones that you have to show acceptance and love to. Number four, you need to be sensitive to their needs and their concerns. You need to hear them. You know, I, I shared something on my social media a while back that I found very in interesting. Listen and silent have the same letters in them. You know, part of being sensitive to other people's needs and their concerns is being willing to listen and not always being quick to have an answer for everything. And the last thing you need, to, you need to do if you're going to really reach out and begin to minister using the gifts that God's given you, you need to look for opportunities to tell people about Christ. You know, God gives us chances every day to share about him. Yeah, you know, I'll give you a perfect example of that. This past weekend was Meredith's birthday. She turned 13 on Saturday. And uh, yeah, yeah, we lined up a great big birthday parade for her. Um, it was a, it was a major victory for the mom and dad victory. Okay. You all that are all teens on here may not understand that as with parents, we got to get our victories where we can get them. Okay. And this was a major victory for, for Jenny and I, but one of the coolest things came out of it the day after I was outside messing around with some stuff and my neighbor came over and he honked his horn first. He was in his driveway and he'd seen that that Meredith has written all over my truck, honk to celebrate Meredith's birthday. And I, it's still on there. Um, and then he comes over and he starts asking me about the parade of people and who all these people were and where they all came from. And I began to share with them. They were from my church and just one thing led to another. And before I knew it, I was getting to plant a little bit of seed with them about they don't have a church home and they might be interested in coming to church once things open back up. See, you don't have to necessarily worry about converting somebody to Christ the first time you talk to them. You just have to be willing to use your gifts and your abilities and your time and your talent to talk to people about Christ. You know, like the story of the priest and from the life of Paul, it's important that we take our hobbies and our interests and our activities and we bring them all under the control of God. And we allow God to use them as a springboard for us to share Christ in the lives of other people. You know, you don't have to, not everybody has to be a preacher. Not everybody has to be a Sunday school teacher. Not everybody has to, has to be a deacon or a leader in the church. Because that's not what everybody's gifted in. But the reality is all of us have something that we could use to share God's kingdom with other people. And when we do that, when we, when we are brave enough to take that step and share Christ with other people, then we just let it go because the rest of it, it, that's out of our hands now. It's all in God's hands. And who knows, somebody may actually come to know Christ because you took five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes to share with them a little bit. Somebody could come into church just because of the way that you treated them or the way that you showed them love. You know, Wilbert Aldry, there's a picture of him here, so everybody can see what he looks like, was the son of a poor preacher in Wiltshire, England. He would go with his father on, on, the, on his visiting rounds, and he especially liked riding the train and talking to the railway workers that he met along the way. Wilbert barely managed to finish college, but he decided to follow his father's footsteps because he liked helping people see God, and he liked helping point, pointing people towards God. The problem was he wasn't a very successful pastor. He was fired from his first church. And for a while, he considered leaving ministry completely. But one event would change Wilbert's life forever. His first child, Christopher. His first child, Christopher, caught the measles. And confined to, confined to his bed, Wilbert amused him with a story that he made up about a little train engine who was sad because he hadn't been out of his shed for a long time. And Christopher asked to hear the story over and over and over. He loved the story. And Wilbert finally wrote it down and he, he illustrated it with some of the, with some crude line drawings of, of some trains with faces on them. And Wilbert's wife saw more and more in this little story than Wilbert ever saw in it. 
So she pushed her husband to offer his book to a publisher. And to his surprise, the book was published. In 1945, the book was published entitled The Three Railway Engines. Book after book followed. All the stories were about little trains with different personalities who interacted in a very simple but very human way. Dramas that would that were involved in every story focused on a message of morality and grace and redemption. Wilbert said, the important thing is, is that the engines are punished and forgiven, but never scrapped. Wilbert Audrey wasn't very successful as a church pastor. He was extremely successful in sharing the love of God in another way. You see, you ask any child if they've ever heard of this guy right here, Thomas the Tank Engine, and you'll see just how successful Wilbert Audrey has been. When asked what he would like engraved on his tombstone, Wilbert Audrey said this, he helped people see God in the ordinary things of life and he made children laugh. Mr. Audrey went to be with the Lord in March of 1997. But what a legacy he had. What an impact he had. All because he was willing to use what God had given him. I wonder, have you ever thought about what your legacy will be? Some time ago, one of my students asked me that, what, what, what do I want to hear? When I get to heaven, I want to hear seven simple words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. But more importantly, there's a song by Ray Bolts. Or more interestingly, and it's called Thank You. And I went on to tell that the, the song talks about that when the songwriter dies and he goes to heaven, all these people are coming up to him saying, thank you for giving to the Lord because I was a life that was changed. And. I told this student, I said, that's what I want. I want to get to heaven and I just want to know that I've impacted people and that God has used me to change lives in simple but extraordinary ways. To me, that would be completely amazing just to have one person after another come up to me in heaven and say, thank you. Because you chose to share your gifts, because you chose to make a difference in the world around you. I'm here. You see, every one of us is called by God to serve and glorify him in all that we do. That doesn't mean that you become a pastor. It doesn't even mean that you respond to God and become a missionary. It doesn't mean that you go into full-time Christian service. Just today, I was having a conversation with one of our young adults here at church. We're hoping to start a small group ministry a part of, as part of our Wednesday night ministry. And, and even in, in spite of everything going on in our world around us, this small group ministry is going to start probably in July, hopefully. And uh, I was talking with them about being a small group leader. And I said, I know you're not called to youth ministry. This is not what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to take the gifts that you have for sharing with students and be a part of our small group ministry. You see, that's what, what Paul is asking us to do in these verses. He's asking us to take the gifts that we have and figure out a way that we can glorify God and a way that we can impact lives. Here's an example. You're an artist. Okay, I am not an artist. I was telling Sophia before we started, I can't draw a lick. I mean, my stick figures are sad. Okay. But some of you are incredibly gifted artists. And if you're a gifted artist, then figure out a way to create art that glorifies God. Maybe you're gifted with your hands and you're great at building things. And you know that you're going to be a construction worker or a carpenter or a contractor, whatever God asks you to do. If it's a construction worker, then build buildings to the glory of God. If you're going to be a chef, maybe all you're going to be all your life is a Walmart employee. But whatever it is, you be it to the glory of God. And you use every chance you've got to glorify God and point people to him. You see, it's our job to grow where God plants us. It's not our job to choose where we get planted. Well, that's that. One last verse I want to share with you here. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. You notice that verse doesn't say 
you only have to do this part of the time. It says, whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus. Wherever it is you are, wherever you find yourself at, whether you're in middle school or high school or a young adult or an older adult, wherever you find yourself at in life, this verse is telling you to do it as a representative of Christ. Giving thanks to God and pointing people to him. You see, I think it's time for all of us to think about how we approach life and how we look at life and the opportunities we have to share our faith with others. Some of you are sitting here in this group tonight because you're a part of this youth group because somebody took time to share a little bit with you and invite you to this church. Imagine if each of us just took time after tonight, all of us are probably going to be on our phones or our social media or whatever, Snapchat, 5,000 other places I know I probably will be. I haven't checked it in a few hours. I'll be looking at it before worship's over or after worship's over tonight. But if we just took a second to look down through our friends list and say, look, I haven't heard from that person in a while. I'm going to send them a text message and say, hey, I missed you at worship tonight. Will you join me for Bible study Sunday morning? Or will you come back next Wednesday night for worship? You see, that's using the little things that God's given you. So I encourage you to take time to, as, as we close out worship tonight, I encourage you to take time and thank God and give him praise as a source for your hobbies and your gifts and your talents and your likes and the things that you want to pour yourself into. And then I encourage you to take time to pray for ways that you can use those things to share the love of God with those around you. Whatever your gifts are, whatever your talents and abilities and strengths are, I promise you God can use them to expand his kingdom if you will only be courageous enough to act on it. Let's pray, guys. Father, I thank you so much for tonight, God. I thank you that we can come here and worship and be in your presence. Father, I pray that you would help all of us look for those opportunities where we can use our gifts and our strengths and our abilities and Lord, even our weaknesses to point people to you, to show people you. Help us be courageous enough to act when you put those opportunities in front of us. We love you. Amen. We're going to sing one final song here, guys. So I encourage you to, to join me as we sing.